so I got a bunch of questions for you guys. I want to start with congrats on the movie. I want to go backwards for a second because I don't think a lot of people realize that, Joe, uh, one of your first professional gigs, I think, was playing Flash Thompson in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was my that was my first movie right out of drama school. Right. Uh, it's crazy to me uh, when, when you think about the, the comic book genre and what it was back then and what it is mm-hmm. now. Um, it, and I bring this up because uh, obviously you guys are playing with the comic book genre and superheroes. Um, so I have to start with Joe. What do you remember about getting to work with Sam Raimi back then? And what did it mean to you? I was a huge fan of Sam Raimi as a director. Um, you also have to remember we started, I auditioned for that movie in 2000. We started shooting in 2001. So, you know, we're talking like two decades ago, that film, Spider-Man was the biggest film ever attempted. And up to that point, the superhero genre was dominated by, or um, I shouldn't say dominated because when you say dominated, you think of like 24 Marvel films to choose from, you know, and DC and, Back then, it wasn't that way. What you really had in terms of the superhero genre was you had Tim Burton's two Batman movies. You had The Crow. Um, Then you've got, you could probably throw Blade into that category. And then the first X-Men. So um, all of those, including even Tim Burton's Batman, had this this feel or this sensibility to it, which was... um, you know, uh, it, it, there, there was there was art, there was a lot of art to it and a lot of story to it, and I think there were some risks that were taken with those films. And you know, Spider Man was really the first film that involved the superhero that wasn't dressed in all black leather, <laughs> and and involved a wider color palette than basically black and gray. And um, you know, I think um, you know, I think that paved the way for big studio you know, the, the studio wave or Marvel taking over and then basically everybody, you know, chasing after them to a certain degree. Um, I think when you, when you, you know, you get into like a lineage of those late eighties, Tim Burton films and the nineties superhero films, I think those connect more easily to a Nolan, the Nolan universe. Um, somewhat, I think those kind of connect with those films. And I think at least in my mind, when I read the script for Arch Enemy, Arch Enemy was like, to me, it felt like a, it felt like a return to those '90s superhero movies, you know, down and dirty, and um, and 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 really, you know, talking about something, or you know, uh, they were they were really like a wild ride. You didn't know what to expect from them. And when I read the script for Arch Enemy. That's kind of what what came up for me. I know this question was about Sam Raimi, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want I wanted to tie it together because. The thing that, and listen, I think you both know this, but like the superhero genre is the most popular genre on the planet. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, I mean, it's all over the planet. Um, And so Adam, I'm curious when you were getting this project off the ground and writing, were you sort of thinking about how can I play in the superhero world um, because of the popularity of the genre or was it just an idea that had been kicking around? Yeah, no, it's funny, it wasn't, because of the popularity in the sense that I want to jump on something that's doing well, it was because of the popularity in the sense that now that people have a lot of familiarity with the mythology of superheroes, we can do something new with it, right? And so like when you talk about comic book movies, what what was Spider-Man in terms of comic book movies? There's also comic book movies like Ghost World or American Splendor which are based on comic books, don't have superheroes, right? But like have a certain kind of aesthetic. And and that's something that I was really interested in was how can we tell a story about superheroes that has a totally different kind of aesthetic than what we're seeing in superhero movies. And they were able to do this. Something Joe and I talk about a lot is that comic books in the eighties when things like Electra Assassin came out or Animal Man or, you know. Uh, uh, the black and white Ninja Turtles. To yeah, a like. It was like, you know, a gritty yeah, retelling like, of like X-Men even. Yeah, they took, they, t- they, they took superheroes and completely changed the way the aesthetics of those stories were told because they knew their audience, you know, had seen the same stories over and over again. And so in, I think it was in 2015, I started writing this movie and I was like, now that people have in it, you know, mainstream movie audiences have 
a context for the multiverse and what an origin story is. And, you know, all of these ideas in, in superheroes, we don't have to tell that same kind of story. We can apply a completely different aesthetic and just bla drop all of these crazy ideas on people and expect that they'd be able to catch up. Can you guys explain what the film is about? And let's just do the, the basic thing for people that are not familiar yet. It's not not a superhero movie, <laughs> but it's also not a superhero movie. It's about a, a, a man who we meet in a bar. He's a extremely you know degraded, down on his luck kind of person who is constantly telling everybody in the neighborhood about how he used to be a vastly powerful superhero from another dimension. But here on earth, he's, he's a drunk who lives under a bridge. And then he meets a young family, a brother and sister who are in big trouble with the local gangsters. And through meeting them, he's able to tell his story more clearly and, and fight to sort of redeem who he is, who he sees himself as a hero. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the first time you guys met each other. Was it um, to meet on this project or had you met earlier than, I guess, when did you guys first meet? Adam, you came over to my house and uh, to, to like read, we were going to read, but I had been introduced. I knew your work. I'd seen Daniel isn't real. Um, you knew Spectre Vision, right? Or you, you knew. And, and I was very there. good friends with, with everybody over at Spectre Vision. I was, uh, I was obsessed with Mandy. I became like, <laughs> like <laughs> crazy about Mandy. And actually, you know, I have this streetway line death saves and, um, I had been in some like real serious talks about doing some some new original pieces, uh, wearable pieces with uh, with the director Panos Cosmatos, and we became friends. And then I, you know, met you know Eli I knew Elijah and, and met Daniel and Lisa and became friends with all of them. And um, Lisa slipped me the script of Arch Enemy to see what I thought because we had been talking about, you know, just doing something together. And uh, she said, I have this thing that might be right for you. And um, uh, let me know what you think. And, and then that led to Adam coming over to my house. What was impressive about meeting Joe and talking to him was, you know, on the one hand, he obviously, you know, I was looking for somebody in this movie who you could believe could have been a superhero, you know, and Joe looks like Superman. You clean him up a little bit more than the pandemic period. He looks like Superman, you know, and it's incredible. But then he also, as we talked, like has this depth of, you know, experience and knowledge about acting. And he is, has a degree in theater. And, you know, he's like the perfect kind of Tennessee Williams character, you know, that that kind of an actor. Like, a, you know, like he's a he's a sensitive, fucked up, deranged actor trapped in the body of a beautiful football player, which is what... Paul Newman is and count on a hot tin roof, right? Like, so that's like the perfect kind of person for me to work with on a, on a movie like this. And we really, and the fact that he is such a huge fan of comic books, like gives us a, you know, we could be like, oh yeah, it's like that to to totally obscure thing about Superman or what, like we had that language and we had the language of, you know, dramatic work and acting and uh, sort of understanding the emotional story. So that it was just, it was good, it was a good fit. Yeah, and, and you know when I read the script, the script reminded me of those scripts in drama school, or those those great, you know, whatever those great. I don't know. It's like um, if Sam Shepard wrote a superhero movie to a certain degree, it'd be some drunken drug addict living in some slum, you know, somewhere under a bridge, who's mumbling on and on about what he used to be and at that point it doesn't matter if he was one or if he wasn't you know for me the acting challenge is there and and it was really one of those things that i mean it was one of the weirdest most out there scripts ever and um i had 100 million questions about it in like the best way possible and you know i, I definitely you know, i wanted to meet adam and um i love daniel isn't real and i saw what he what he could do with that and i thought about um, you know, that applied to this movie. And then, of course, the conversations that we had about all of the non-mainstream comic books that, that we loved back in the day and those what-if stories. And this became a real, you know, it was doable. Like, I saw the path. It was like, oh, we could, we could do this. Like, this could, this could work. Um, and uh, 
and that was it, man, with joint forces. The thing that I really uh, dug is that the film has a different um, visual style than I think people are going to be expecting. You have some animated sequences, um, and it's it's just very distinct style. How did you decide on the look of the animation um, and wanting to put the animation in? Yeah, so to me, the, the style, like the style of a movie is so crucial. That's my job as a director. And, and I want to only ever do things that are super stylish and really have like a clear visual identity, but that has to come from what the emotional story is, right? So th I, I referred to this style to everybody I was working with as romantic brutalism. It's like how I kept talking about it and we sort of dug into what that would mean and what that would look like in it. And it had a certain, you know, like the gr that it's so gritty, but also there's all these beautiful reflections and neon and that kind of stuff comes from that. And the animation, you know, the, the idea that we were gonna tell his story, the story of his stories and his memories, what the fuck is that gonna look like so that it's exciting and cool and has a level of abstraction, but still communicates something. Um, and a huge reference to me was Pink Floyd, The Wall the way that they use animation in that movie. It's a story about a rock star who's losing his mind, but this animation tells you his dreams and his fantasies. And uh, Electra Assassin, what Bill Sienkiewicz did in the 80s with Electra Assassin, with um, with his Daredevil book, Love and War, like that it, it's a mix of children's drawings and photorealistic pencil work and shit glued onto a canvas. And um, so th those were the two big influences that I went in when talking to the artists and the animators and then making sure that it had like a searing color palette because it's very, very, it's very important to me that this is a movie that like immerses you into a world. And, you know, we, one thing I said to you, Joe, at the very beginning, I don't know if you remember this, like I, I wasn't super into clarity. I was into the clarity of the vision, but not the clarity of like understanding specific story points. And I said to you like your voice when you're telling the story should be more like, the lead guitar in a Slayer song, you know, like a guitar solo in a, in a Slayer song where it's not about like the precision of the melodies, it's about the expression of it. Yeah, and I think, you know, you and I, we have like similar film references and, you know, I think I, I remember talking about Stalker, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the old, the old Russian film and, and, and kind of making something that was, um, you know, it didn't necessarily have to answer its own questions. And, and I think that um, that was a lot of fun for me was, was this idea that, um, you know, the character doesn't have answers. And, and a lot of times he doesn't know it's, it's foggy and he's been back and forth between this, you know, or at least in his mind between these different realities as you kind of ride this ride. Um, so, you know, my job as an actor is to answer all those questions or at least know what I'm doing. But, you know, the real challenge was to, you know, make choices based upon a character who has who doesn't really know what's going on or is confused. And um, and I think that that's, you know, I was excited about the kind of ride that that could maybe provide for an audience. Um, because if <laughs> if I'm not sure what the answers are and the character doesn't isn't sure, then you know, in a really wonderful way. Um, and and that's another thing I loved about this the script too was it, like it didn't pander. You know, I mean, there, there's moments of it that are educational, talking about lofty scientific terms, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pander, um, you know, and that's really true to the characters. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, I think one thing that's cool about the character is that you're a guy who is drunk, drinking all the time, and also you're talking about how you've experienced multiple realities in different dimensions and you've gone through black holes. And so I, I think one thing we were always doing is like imagining what the mind of that person would be like I think when we you know when you look at a character like Doctor Strange it's like how does that guy keep it together like how do you you know how do you go through like a million multiple versions of yourself getting killed and reborn and not be a complete lunatic I think that was part of the influence on what what the character would be well and the other side of it too is that the character you know isn't a scientist or doesn't come from a science background so you've got almost like you know it's 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 being filtered out of a layman if you will um, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's like, it's a layman who's been through like countless medical operations explaining to you over the breakfast table of what, like how, how surgery works. 
And, yeah. and I think that that was that was kind of it because he's been through so much of it. And it's not to say that he was he even understood it before it happened to him. He's been trying to catch up with it. And so I, I think that that's, you know, there's there's different grades of people in the film that have certain amounts of scientific knowledge. And, you know, it was kind of interesting finding the balance for for Max. Yeah, there's there, there's a great little moment, you know, because you're always talking to hamster who's trying to like boil it down into these really simplified archetypical terms. Right. And he's like, did you punch bad guys? Like, is that that's what you're telling me? Right. You punch bad guys. And, you, and your line is like, I've been through the cosmic tendrils of time. And you're talking about punching like. And it's just like such a disconnect and like, I don't know, I just, I love that sense that you just, you, you know, you're never even really quite there. Cause it's like, you know, the post-trauma of a cosmic superhero. Right, 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 yeah, right, yeah. I definitely have to bring up uh, the fact that Glenn Howerton is basically, you don't even realize it's him in the movie. You know, he's so, I, I, when I first saw him on screen, I didn't, it took me a little while to realize that was Glenn. Um, and then you also have Paul Shear who does his thing, which uh, I don't want to reveal anything about his character, but talk a little bit about getting Paul and, and Glenn in the movie and Glenn's look, uh, because it is unique. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, clearly something that I like to do is, is work with actors who like have an iconic look and I, an iconic style, even like Joe, and then help them deconstruct that into a character, you know, into the movie where they're going to be a whole new person. And, and so with Glenn, like, you know, as a guy who's primarily we know as a hysterically funny uh, comic actor, you know, putting him in a in a more dramatic role in a more dramatic movie and letting him find that part of himself. So he was just excited to like figure out what kind of crazy look. You know, the blonde hair, the mustache. It's 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 an incredible look on him. Well, listen, and, man, how about those little John Stockton tennis shorts, man? Let's not yeah. forget about that. That's well, like I mean, you know, spoilers, that is a climactic moment when he, Sorry. When you see his legs. <laughs> and I think, I think I'm helping to sell the movie right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. You do you do get to see Glenn Howard in, in tennis shorts. It's basically the climax of the movie to see that. <laughs> to see his yeah. knees. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I think a lot of people don't know about Glenn is he's so well known for his sitcom work, but Glenn is a Juilliard guy. There's a reason why that guy's so good at what he does, um, but it's great to be able to see him in, you know, in other roles, I think, because his, his depth of knowledge is so deep and his toolbox is so, so big, you know, he, he's great. Yeah, he's an actor who's who's been really successful at being funny because he's a good actor in general. And so he fell into being hilariously funny for 15 straight years. But give him a chance to be, you know, terrifying or menacing and all that. And he could do that, too, which is mm -hmm. so fun. And same with Paul. I mean, what's great about Paul is Paul is a master of improvisational acting. So the scene he's in, he's more or less doing the entire script as written, but he's using everything they gave him. He's using... I'm going to spoil too much, but he's using the snakeskin boots they gave him. He's using the tattoos on his face. He's using all of the pills and alcohol bottles that they put on. You know, it's like he looks around and he's like, what, do, what am I wearing? What do I have? What's around me? And used, you know, something that people kept saying when we shot that scene was he used the work of every department. Like in this one moment, he just brings together the, the set, the makeup, the, the, the decor, you know, and like and finds a way to incorporate that into the scene. And yeah, he has. You know, uh, he's his, insane. Uh, his scene is quite good. I will just say it like that. Uh, yeah. You obviously, you guys made this. You obviously uh, uh, had a finite budget and a finite schedule. What was the toughest stuff to pull off with the limited resources and time that you had? <laughs> Making the movie. <laughs> it was a. It was. It was the most brutally difficult project I've ever done in my life. The. Um, the time we had, the, the, the budget that, I mean, we felt like we were cursed by a witch. I mean, we had people getting getting sick and suddenly unable to show up on days when we had crucial scenes and figuring out how to like revise the script or change our plan and move things around. I mean, it it was, every movie is a, is a bit of a fire that you have to deal with in this. Th this was so rough, but I think that the way that we were able, but because we knew what the movie was so well, we were able to adapt to it and in some ways make it better. Like some, some, something would fall apart and then Joe and I would be like, okay, well, we can't do any of what we thought we were going to do, but this character, like, let's just show him walking around and trying to do this thing and trying to do that thing. And that's what we're really trying to communicate anyway. And from the very start, I realized it's going to behoove me 
to not only prep for what we're shooting that day, but make sure that I'm prepped with a whole bunch of other stuff too. <laughs> you know, just in case, you know, things went sideways or this didn't work out the way that we needed to. And we're just going to pick the cameras up and go move somewhere. And I'm going to start delivering speeches I would have delivered in a different location, but over here, or, you know, we're going to try to film that dialogue from a different angle, you know? And, and so, you know, I think like Adam's saying, there was a lot of like really great, I mean, you say cursed by a witch, but you know, I say, you know, we were, we were just making lemonade out there all day long. And I think some of the, some fantastic, uh, some of my favorite parts of the film came out of necessity. And I think that's, that's the beauty actually of working on indie films and working at this budget and this speed uh, with a, a filmmaker of the caliber of Adam is that it means that there's not a lot of distraction and there's not a lot of checks and balances in the way of us pivoting in the moment if we know that something else is going to work better. And I think that was such a, a weapon for us um, for making a film of this size is the fact that if you have a strong nucleus, you can just pivot. You know, we were just pivoting, making decisions in the moment, um, you know, and, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, most ways making the film better. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, the, one of my biggest influences on this movie was Wong Kar Wai, right? I was like, what would it be like if Wong Kar Wai made a superhero movie? What would that look like? And the way he makes movies, at least, you know, his first dozen movies or whatever was, he shows up on the day with the set, with the set and the actors and Chris Doyle, the greatest cinematographer of all time, and goes, so what should we do today? Oh, look, there's a sink. Let's do a scene where you're washing your face. You know, and I've always been jealous of that way of working. And sometimes we had such big disasters on set that I actually got to work that way and it was great. And it was, and it was me at my happiest being like, okay, here's what we're gonna do today, guys. And like, it's just, it's so great because the actors know what they're doing and everybody knows the style of the movie and now we can do a thing. Sorry, I hope this doesn't seem too vague. I don't want, cause I'll never want to say like, this is a scene we wrote on the day and this isn't cause then people receive the movie the wrong way. But being able to, to be so playful under the uh, incredible stress of it is to me like the best way to make a movie. Well, I want specifically, Joe, you have a lot of experience uh, doing action. You've done action stuff before. And in this movie, you have to do action. Um, how did your previous work uh, doing action set pieces help this film? Because obviously you didn't have the resources that you might have on a, on a bigger movie. Were you able to, you know, facilitate and help? Because there's some, there's a, I, I don't want to give anything away because no one has seen it yet but I, I'm thinking of like an apartment scene where you're fighting some people and it's brutal and bloody. And you obviously are again, making this on a schedule and a budget. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm no longer, you know, I'm, I'm no longer the, the, you know, the baby on the set, if you will, you know, I'm not, I'm not, fr I'm not a freshman anymore. Um, I've been doing this, you know, I've been doing this a couple decades. You talk about Spider-Man, that was two decades ago. So um, that also, yeah, involves some action and fighting. You know, I think what happens, you know, even the bigger the set, I'm still the one who has to do it all. So, you know, when, you know, the buck stops with you for that long, um, yeah, you know, I've, 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 I wanna say I put in my 10,000 hours of fighting and shooting and, killing people, <laughs> you know? And, and I think um, on a film like this, that shooting as quick as this, I don't wanna do a second take. I wanna nail everything on the first. And so it becomes this dance, it becomes choreography, it becomes a way of telling a story in the moment. And I don't know, I think that's something that, that I've always enjoyed. And, and um, you know, like that scene that you're talking about in the apartment, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know how many times we can do it again. And I don't know how many costume pieces we have to do it again. And frankly, we don't have time to reset me again to do it again. So, you know, my goal is to come in there and, and nail it, like absolutely nail it in frame, the, the way the gimmicks work. And, and so, you know, um, 
you know, I'm sorry for anyone who tries to talk to me on a day or, you know, <laughs> while I'm getting ready to do something like that, because I can't. I'm concentrating on like 10 different variables that I um, that I need to nail in something that's, you know, five seconds fast and it's over. So, um, but I, I enjoy that. I like that kind of pressure. It makes me feel like I'm a tightrope walker or something. I'm up there and there's no net and you better nail this thing or, or we're screwed and we're not going to make our day. So I, I really do like that kind of pressure. And I'm you gonna, love I, working with stuntmen. You love working with the choreographers, like seeing you hang with them. It was like, you guys are like a band. Like you just really click with that stuff. And then, all you know, you also have some experience working on movies where you're like, a SWAT guy or a gun guy or whatever. So we could, I could talk to you as if you, you are the character who knows what this stuff is and be like, no, I wouldn't hold it like this. I do, do it in the yeah. and I'd be like, okay, Joe's got like, don't tell Joe to hold a gun like this. I'll tell you 15 minutes about why it's going to jam. <laughs> true. It's very true. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm basically out of time with you guys, but um, I, Joe, I do have to ask you, I'm incredibly excited to see Zack Snyder the Snyder cut mm -hmm. because I, I want to see the the extended version of all of Zach's movies are always better from mm -hmm. Watchmen to BVS to you name it. It's always better. Um, have you, are, have you seen anything of the Snyder cut? Uh, and I have to ask, are you doing any additional photography for it? I knew you're going to ask me this, man. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I knew it. Um, well, by, by the way, I, I'm asking because I'm a legit fan and I really want to know. And yes, yeah, I know. And there's, there's lighter, a... So we, the fans want to know too. I know. And they're going to go crazy and they're going to come back at me with whatever I say. So, um, you know, I'll, I can't, you know, that's, if, if I was a part of it, that wouldn't be my, it wouldn't be my place to announce that. That would be Zach's place. Um, so, you know, um, whether or not that's happening, you know, that's, that is not, that is a, that is an answer that is above my, below my NDA level or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Can we just lie and say that Deathstroke appears in Arch Enemy so that 10 million more people see it? <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, you can go watch Arch Enemy. It's, you know, you'll see some similarities. Just real quick though, have you seen any extra stuff? Did Zach ever show you like a longer version or you're gonna be, have you seen any of that? Well, look, I mean, you know, on my social media, I talked about, you know, there there was an original end credit sequence that was altered for the release of Justice League. Once Batman was canceled, they altered that scene. So here you go. I mean, it's, it's, you know, but I, I wrote about that on my social media. There, there's an original scene that will be restored to its, you know, to what it was originally. I'll just stop it there, but um, for real, uh, uh, congrats on the movie. And uh, I, I really always like supporting indie cinema and this is indie cinema. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Steve.